Welcome back to Between the Levees. I am joined today by retired Captain Sam Schropp. I found him in the comments on Facebook, spinning some yarns about past experiences and uh, reached out then. Been a little bit of trouble trying to connect with him. He's into a few, a few things in his retirement, but worked for Ingram for 15 years in the 90s and early 2000s, was a trip pilot from 05 to 2020, and happily retired in early 2020. Captain Schropp, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, if you've seen these before, you know how they begin, sir. Tell me, where were you born? I was born in Hackensack, New Jersey, of all places. My father uh, got out of the Air Force and was working around trying to find a job with the airlines, and we were staying there because it was close to his parents. Uh, we then moved to St. Louis, Missouri. My dad went to work for Ozark Airlines in 1959. So uh, we lived outside north of St. Louis. Uh, my parents bought a pleasure boat in 1964. I started screwing around with boats on the upper Mississippi River in, in uh, Pool 26. And in 1967, they bought property alongside the river at mile 227 across from the head of Boulder Island. And because of the way my dad worked, we spent most of our time at that place. Uh, got to play with boats, uh, floods, go to school in a boat out to where the, the high ground where the car was. And when I graduated from high school in 1975, I went to work on the Golden Eagle Ferry, which was the last paddle wheel ferry operating on the Mississippi River. I uh, did that for three years while I was going to the University of Missouri at St. Louis and decided I wasn't learning anything in college that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I went to work. I had a, a passenger operator's license at the time. I got that in 1978. And I went to work for Strecka Steamers on the excursion boats that run on the St. Louis Riverfront. So uh, three months of that at 90 hours a week for $600 a month, I figured I better go to work on line haul towboats and make some real money. Before we get too, too far down that road, um, let's back all the way up. What did your father do for the Air Force? He was a fighter pilot. Uh, the uh, Korean War was going on when he graduated from college. And uh, he went and enlisted and then got a draft notice. And he had to appear for the draft notice. He showed up in the Marine Corps representative and told him he was now a Marine. So there was a whole bunch of that kind of fussing back and forth between the services before the Air Force said, yep, he's got a prior contract. And uh, he went that wound up in a, uh, when the war ended, in a maintenance test group in San Angelo, Texas where he met my mother, who was a stewardess for Delta CNS Airlines at the time. And so my dad and his buddies would sign out airplanes on a weekend and take a weekend pass and run down to Miami or New Orleans or Houston or wherever my mom was stationed. And then they'd have a big party. A bunch of fighter pilots show up, have a big time, and then go home on Monday and go back to work. And how did their relationship blossom from there? How'd they end up in New Jersey? Well, yeah. So, you know, the way they actually met, there was a, a Texas A&M was playing at Rice. And one of his buddies came in and said, hey, man, they're playing at Rice this weekend. Let's get an airplane, fly down to Houston. There'll be a whole bunch of honeys hanging around. And so from there, they kind of went on. Now, my mother uh, was from Steelville, Missouri, south of St. Louis. And my dad was from New Jersey. And so... Uh, when the, when he got out of the Air Force, uh, they went back to New Jersey, and he was uh, working as an insurance adjuster and working on his flight qualifications, keeping all them current. And at that time, uh, the federal government was promoting air travel. So uh, Ozark Airlines was one of the regional airlines across the country that had mail contracts that made it financially viable to haul people from Springfield, Missouri to St. Louis or Jefferson City. They were small airplanes, they were DC-9s, and the mail contracts are what made the airline profitable. Tell me about early life in New Jersey. I don't remember any of that. We were two years old when I left, and I'm just as happy I didn't. We would go back. How can anybody live in a place like this? So I wound up... Uh, you know, in, in rural areas of Illinois and Missouri in, in my growing up, growing up time. 
Well, walk me through that experience through school, I guess, into, uh, into and through high school. Yeah, so uh, I went to a public school in St. Charles, Missouri, and graduated from St. Charles High School. And then went to the University of Missouri at St. Louis for three years and didn't get a, a degree. And uh, like I say, I was working on, on a passenger ferry while I was going to college. And it was like a lot of places, uh, you know, where I was living in, in Wyoming and, and in Utah when I was living there, young guys went to work on oil rigs or went to work cowboy. Well, where I was in Calhoun County, Illinois, in Golden Eagle, Illinois, guys either were commercial fishermen or worked on towboats and uh that i walked i was around the water around towboats uh they would push in waiting on traffic push in waiting on on uh, weather now uh, i'd ride my bicycle down there and holler at them and climb a ladder and go in there and look at the boats and so i started and my dad was very interested in towboating we, we we played a game as kids and you see the RWNA or the Jack Wolford or those boats coming up the river from two miles downstream. It would be who could guess the name of that boat first. We were there enough that we were familiar with what was running on the upper miss. And you could just kind of judge by the shape and the paint job that it was an ACBL boat or a commercial barge line boat or Artco boat. Uh, and so you just kind of take a guess then from the shape and the size of the tow who it was. Tell me about the job on the ferry. The ferry was originally given a charter by the federal government to run a ferry across from Illinois to Missouri to a man named Camp, K-A-M-P. Captain Camp is who Campsville, Illinois is named after. And he started this ferry uh, running across the river and it eventually became, it was a family business. Uh, the man I was working for, Fred W. Pullman, had married a camp and worked on the ferry, and that's how he got the concession. And it was a family-owned business. Uh, the deckhands, the pilots were all, all family. I was the first non-family guy to get a job on there. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I walked up to one of the guys and said, hey, you, know, you need a deckhand for the summer. And he said, yeah, what, do you, what kind of money do you want? I said, I'll take minimum wage, which at that time was $2.32 an hour. Got on there, knew how to tie a boat off, but you had to learn the configuration to get the cars arranged properly to trim the boat so it would handle good and get enough, enough of them on there. I worked uh, from 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 10 in the evening, and then came back the next morning at 5 a.m. and worked another eight-hour shift. And then I got a couple of days off and then I would do that same schedule again. And on the weekends when they were really busy with tourists, especially during the fall when everybody's out looking at tree colors, uh, they would pick me up as the, as the second deckhand on the boat. So uh, I was getting a partial scholarship to go to college and the money I was making on the ferry was making up the rest of that money. And at that time, uh, 15 hour, a 15 hour semester at the University of Missouri in-state tuition cost me $240. So I could make enough money working in the summer to go to college for the rest of the year. What were you studying in college? Well, I wanted to be a physical education major. I was a swimmer. And my dad insisted that I be a business major. And after three years of business courses, I figured out I wasn't learning anything there that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, being 21 years old and a little bit silly, I went off looking for adventure and jumped on a line boat. What year was that, first of all? That was 1978. And in 1978, when I decided I wanted to go to work on line haul towboats, I went to the library and got the yellow pages for New Orleans and Cincinnati and Louisville and St. Louis and St. Paul. And I went through there under the listing barge lines. And I called every barge line that I found in the books and talked to them and got applications for some and got on the list for others. And the first towboat company that called me is who I went to work for. 
And it, it actually, uh, John Crivello, who is an old crew dispatcher name, uh, called me first from uh, Wisconsin Barge Lines. And I went down to Sunset Hills, Missouri and interviewed with him and came back. And that very afternoon, I got a call from a crew dispatcher at Inland Oil and Transport Company asking me if I could be on a boat that night. And so missed an opportunity to work for Wisconsin, bird in the hand, and went to work, went to uh, national maintenance in October of 1978 and walked out and got on the Lady Mignon for Inland Oil and Transport Company as a green deckhand. And what was the orientation and onboarding process for that? Well, yeah. The captain looked at the other deckhand and said, show him around, show him what he's supposed to do. And so that all worked out okay. He showed me how to make coffee and when I was supposed to go to work. And we went out and picked up a bunch of rigging and uh, left there. I guess they'd come out of the shipyard, went to uh, Riverways Fleet in St. Louis and picked up a southbound tow of mixed grain barges. We were in the fall, we were, Inland Oil and Transport was primarily a unit tow or liquids company. But in the fall, they would haul dry cargo barges along with their empty units because the, the rates were good. So we picked up a whole bunch of SCNO barges, strapped a four piece unit in alongside that, and headed south. And so then here's my big adventure. Boy, we're off on this big adventure. And I'm wandering around after, I was a Jimmy Buffett fan at the time. And Jimmy Buffett has a song called Son of a Son of a Sailor. And one of the lines in the song is, expanding the view of the captain and crew like a man just released from indenture. And that's, that's how I felt. And we, I woke up the next morning on a southbound tow near Herculaneum and was walking out around amongst the barges and tightening ratchets and thinking, this is where I belong, man. I'm finally free. I'm really enjoying this. And there was no turning back after that. Walk me through that first southbound trip. So we had a four-piece unit. I don't know, we think we picked up like eight, eight or 10 grain barges, had two strings, strapped that bunch in alongside, one man on each watch, two men on call watch. So when I get out there, I, I had, uh, while working on for Streck for steamers on the excursion boats, I had gotten acquainted with Richard Garner, who was kind of a legend in the St. Louis Harbor at the time, who worked for Eagle Fleet. And I would talk to him on the radio when I was running one of the excursion boats. And he invited me to start coming down as a ride along. So I'd go ride in evenings with him and his crew. And I learned about rigging up barges and, and spotting barges at docks and those kind of things. Even though I really didn't have hands on and cranking a ratchet, I knew what they were, knew what the wires were, knew how they were laid and configured. So that gave me a pretty good idea of what I was going to be doing when I got on a line haul towboat. I woke up the next morning, the tow was built. We were headed southbound and uh, captain called me up there and I did my cleanup. And then out on the tow, I went with my tools by myself to start tightening ratchets and checking for water. And if I would run into a pretty good sized problem, then I would go up, wake up one of the call watch guys. You know, I, there was a couple of times that I had a ratchet that I was trying to rehook and C bars, Johnny bars in 1978 were not a real common thing. You know, you would thread a cheater pipe over the pelican hook and pull it over, but then you were going to have to hold it with your hand, pull the cheater pipe off, squeeze it the rest of the way down and get a keeper on it. And so to go out and try and tighten a ratchet or re-tighten re a ratchet or get a ratchet to, to hook so that you could really get a ratchet to take was a little bit difficult for one guy. So I'd go back and wake up the mate every once in a while. Man, you got to get out of bed and come help me with this. So uh, that trip went along. I rode 50 days my first trip and I gained 25 pounds because I could eat as much as I wanted to eat three meals a day. And I was working hard, plenty of physical exercise. 
Uh, along during that trip, we had a crew change. And the highlight of that, of that first couple of years with Inland Oil and Transport was working with a mate named Howard Timms, T-I-E-M-S, from Metropolis, Illinois. And uh, everybody called him Pappy. When I was working with, with, with Howard Timms, he was 72 years old. And he would tell me stories about decking on steam towboats. He had started out in the 1920s for Federal Barge Line. And on when they had a crew of about 20 people on a steam towboat, and they would only be running six regulation, six standard barges, but they had this big crew of, of uh, a captain and a pilot, uh, a licensed mate, a cook, a cook's helper, a couple of maids, uh, engine room assistant engineer, engineer oilers, a whole string of people there, and uh, then a mate, what we called at the time a watchman, what they call a, a lead man now. And then uh, three deckhands on each watch because they did everything by hand. They were the old steamboat ratchets that were about six foot long, had a tremendous reach and pull. And they, uh, they didn't have uh, gasoline powered pumps. They put a device down in the wing, these, in these wing tanks and then dropped a bucket and pivot. And it would fill up with water and they'd pick it up and dump the water out and go back down in and get more water out of the wing tanks on the barges. So it was a really labor intensive endeavor. They were, they're only pushing six barges, but they got like 20 people on the boat. And Happy K takes me out the first night he's on the boat. He and I talked a little bit and he hands me a ratchet, says, put that on your right shoulder. And he hands me a wire and says, put that on your left shoulder. And he hands me a strap and shows me how to hold the wire in the links so they're not knocking all over the place. And he said, now where's your flashlight? I said, it's in my back pocket. So he pulls the flashlight out of my back pocket and says, open your mouth. And when I do, he puts my flashlight in my mouth. And he says, now, when you get to be a pilot, I will know that you are one pilot that carried a full set of rigging. Follow me. And we would go out across the tow, and he would tell me old towboat stories. He, uh, the, full, the whole time we were out there, he carried a, uh, a dishwashing liquid bottle of oil. And so I'd go out, and he'd show me how to lay the wires. I'd hook up the ratchet. He squirt some oil on the threads and he's okay, tighten that ratchet. And then he'd tell me more stories while I was tightening the ratchet. And man, I mean to tell you, this was just like a release for a kid that had never been much anywhere out of Golden Eagle, Illinois. You know, I'd run down through the, the Grand Tower pipeline. It's about when I was coming on watch in the morning, walked out there, and there's this pipeline at Grand Tower. And I asked the tankerman, what's that? And he explained it to me. We ran on down. I watched him flank around Gray's Point, and I was just eating this stuff up, watching all this. Uh, we went down through Memphis, and we got to Memphis in the evening. So I was out checking tow, and all the lights and the bright lights of Memphis, like the Little Feet song, I'm looking at the bright lights of Memphis coming by. And uh, we dropped the, the grain barges. Just dropped out of nowhere. Uh, I, I heard you say bright lights of Memphis. Yep, the bright lights of Memphis. And as a little aside, I live way out in the boonies now. I'm one of the, uh, we're working on getting grants for some high-speed internet out here. I've got a radio tower on the mountain that beams a beam down to me here. And that's how I get my internet. So it's a little slow at times. So the bright lights of Memphis, man. I mean, I'm walking around out there. Uh, I saw a meme a while back that said, if you can't handle me spouting random song verses, we just can't get along because, you know, we're coming down on the upper Memphis bridge and I'm looking at all the lights and I think the bright lights of Memphis in the Commodore hotel. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I thought, man, look at this. I'm living these songs now. So we dropped it, dropped the grain barges at Baton Rouge. 
and went on down to uh, IMT St. Rose and wheeled in there to start loading gasoline to take back to uh, St. Louis, to Wood River. And one of the dock men, and I've never been out, man. I don't, I, you know, I hadn't been off the farm much. And so I'm down there amongst all these Cajun accents and the dock man comes down and uh, I'm the guy on watch and the tankermen are out on tow. And he says, do you have any community coffee? And I said, well, yeah, I'd never, I didn't know anything about community coffee. He's, and, and this guy has got a pretty good Cajun accent. He says, mind if I make a pot? Well, I didn't know that we were not allowed to make community coffee in that. We had a different pot for that. So I let him make co community coffee in the pot on the Mr. Coffee. And he pours me a cup. And I thought, my God, this smells like the socks have been laying around in my locker for too long. And I tasted it and I thought, damn, this tastes like that stuff they're loading in the barge. It smells. But I acquired a taste for it. And that was just a, you know, this was just an adventure. I mean, an adventure to go listen to Cajun accents and see ships coming by and ship assist tugs and going into these monster docks. You know, IMT dock at, at St. Rose is probably 40 feet high so that they can load ships and they can still load as the river goes up and down. I've been around the upper mist and it goes up and down, but not like the lower. One of the really things that has stuck out in my mind is we were coming down on old LaGrange light at Greenville. And all the old timers will know where I'm talking about. And, that, and they've gotten it straightened out and they've built a bunch of structures that made that whole section of river from, uh, from the dikes up there, that always gets to be a mess up above. And, and I've been off the river so long, my mind went blank, but I can see them in my head. To go down into the Grange, flank around down there and come out past the mouth of the harbor and head over to Valcluse and Spanish Moss was a big deal. And there's all these river boils popping up. And uh, I'm out there with the other deckhand and he points at the boils coming up off of the river, off the dikes, and he says, you see those? And I said, yeah. And he says, those will suck you right to the bottom. He says, if I go in the river, I'm taking this life jacket off first thing because that'll drag you right down. And I thought, man, I've been swimming in this river all my life and water skiing and stuff. And I've floated over those boils over dikes. This guy's full of crap. But there was no point in starting an argument. If you want to believe that a work fest is going to drag you under and you're going to peel out of it when you fall in the river, have at it, dude. I can't help you. So that was an up. That guy was from Arkansas. My roommate was a former rural postmaster from Mississippi. On the other watch, we had a guy that had a PhD in philosophy that wanted to come out and for adventure and see something new. So tow boating at that time was a whole bunch different than this time. Some of it was really good and fun, but the best thing they ever do, did was institute drug testing. Because often, you know, I'll tell guys that I started tow boating in 1978, and they'll say, oh, the good old days. And that's, well, a lot of times it was like living in a hornet's nest. These guys were going to town and drinking, and they were smoking weed, and there was all kinds of things going on. For a little old country boy, it was, it was an eye opener. Can you share with me any especially memorable stories from Pappy? Yeah. So here's a dandy. We had, so the crew change was they were decrewing another boat. So they, we had a crew change coming up and Pappy came over with the crew change. Pappy forgot to load, to pack his suitcase. He just picked up his suitcase and came over. Our boat left all his clothes on the Lady Marjorie. And he didn't realize it till the next morning when he opened his suitcase. So Pappy would wear his long underwear under his coveralls while he washed his clothes. Then he would wear his clothes under his coveralls while he washed his outer clothes. 
until we got the rest of his clothes to catch up with. Happy ran, and for those who are listening from Metropolis, Illinois, Happy ran Tim's Pool Hall, which was like a landmark in, in Metropolis. And he would tell me stories about how the police would come in one and do you know this guy? Do you keep an eye on this guy? And he'd say, screw you, get the hell out of here. And so he was still a river rebel even when he was home. Uh, he told me a story about when he was a he, well, and one of the crew members I missed earlier was a cabin boy. And that's how Pappy got his start on the river was as a cabin boy at 14 years old. And one night, uh, down below, uh, well, it was it was around the mouth of the White River. There was an island where uh, some guys cooked moonshine. And it was getting foggy, so they pushed this steamboat with its barges and a, dra a pile driving rig in against the bank to wait the fog out. And they took up a collection and told Pappy, if you go up on this island and go out across there, you'll find this guy still, and he will sell us a bunch of moonshine. So the collection was 25 cents. He brought all this moonshine back that he bought for 25 cents, and they all got drunk. And as part of, and, and along somewhere during this period of having a good time drinking, the pile driving crew decided it would be a good idea to drive pilings around the tow so that it couldn't float away from the bank and everybody could pay attention to drinking and playing cards. And the next morning when everybody woke up and the fog had burned off, the tow was stuck in against the island with pilings driven on the outside. And Federal Barge Line came down and fired everybody but, you know, like Pappy and the cook and the, and the cook's helpers and stuff. So that that I got a kick out of that one. I thought, but you wouldn't you wouldn't wouldn't hear any of that or see any of that in this day and age. Certainly not. So where did your career take you next? So I went from an entry level deckhand to a tankerman, and because I already and then to a deck mate. And my purpose, my intent when I left Streck the steamers when I left college was to be a towboat pilot. And I already had a 100 gross ton masters, uh, 100 gross, gross ton passenger license. So I had some days in and had, had some days on the books with the Coast Guard. As soon as I, I got my time in, I tested for an operator of uninspected towing vessels in, not, in October of 1980. And I passed that test for Western Rivers and I went to uh, the River School, the original incarnation, which was run by Betty Hutto and her husband, whose first name I've forgotten, and got my inland waters license. Along about that time, I got a call from Ernie Lorenzi, who uh, was from originally from Greenville, and he was the uh, kind of the Marine superintendent at, Ingr or at uh, Inland Oil and Transport. And he asked me if I wanted to take a job working in the office. At that time, I, coming out of college and being a young guy, I had a plan. I was gonna be a towboat pilot. I was gonna do these things. I was gonna be a port captain. And uh, that was how my career was gonna go. So in building a resume, I took that job with Inland Oil and Transport in the office. And I worked as a barge manager for them for six months, which was a very good experience because I got to attend the Coast Guard, a whole bunch of Coast Guard functions, propeller club functions, got to meet people, and then learn about repairs at the shipyard. So gas-free, uh, welding, gouge and weld, taking pieces out. I would go to what at that time was National Marine and walk through with the Coast Guard rep and the National Marine representatives and laying out repairs to tank barges. Uh, I finally decided, boy, this, this office stuff is not for me. I'm a boat guy. And uh, I may, Saint, in St. Louis, Gladder's barge line was, well, Huffman and Gladder's were the other two barge lines 
of course, Valley Line Federal and, and the union companies were there. But uh, I was talking with, uh, with Gladders Barge Lines with Rick Bensing, who was kind of the Marine superintendent at Gladders. And I called him and said, hey, I've got a license. Do you have a job open? And he said, well, we don't have any steersmen. We don't have a steersman program, but are you a good boat hand? Well, ask a guy that wants to be a towboat pilot if he can run a towboat. Hell yeah, I can run a towboat. Just show me how to start it. And so he sent me to the HK Thatcher, which was an 1800 horsepower boat doing shift work around the apex dock at Port Allen, Louisiana. So I had, on, in my off hours at Inland Oil and Transport, I had steered and handled towboats. I'd grown up running small boats and cabin cruisers and houseboats and had some experience handling 200 foot excursion boats. So heck yeah, man, I can handle a boat. Send me on down here. So I flew into Baton Rouge on Mid-South Airlines at the time and went to uh, over to Port Allen, got on the boat. And a guy I had worked with at Inland Oil and Transport, Sam Williamson, was the chief engineer on this little 1800 horsepower, 85 foot long boat. And uh, first thing I did was called up Sam and said, hey, start him up, man. I need to figure out how this thing handles and how it works. And we were on the inside of the apex dock on the shore side, facing downstream. So I had to pick this boat up, turn it around, get it out from behind the dock, take it around, figure out how it works, bring it back in there, and then make a downstream landing again. Hell, I had never made a downstream landing. When I was riding along with Richard Garner at Eagle Marine, he had let me land spot barges, even land a, a, a five string in at one of the coal docks. Hell, I'd never made a downstream landing, but I'd watched it. So let's give it a try. Uh, the next day, part of our, what was going on at Apex Port Allen was the guy that was the superintendent there, W.P. Jackson Jr., had decided he could save money by having us do all the line handling work for the ships that came into that dock. And for the people that run the lower, they know that line handling crews come out with a specialized boat and a specialized crew and take the bow lines out to the anchor buoys, laying along the anchor buoys. Well, they wanna take me, they want me to drop in facing upstream and drop under the bow of this tanker and the crew on a tanker are going to dump their mooring lines on the stern deck of the HK Thatcher. And then I am going to take this boat and, the and all of these lines up to the anchor buoys and hold it still against an anchor buoy while one of my guys steps over onto the anchor buoy and they hand the eye across so they can hook it in the buoy. We don't do things like that in 2020 or 2023, but this was 1980 and I needed a job. So I'd lay in there and hold this thing as best I could when they ran over there and did that work. And I thought, hell, that's the way things are done. Until I saw a line crew would come out with their small boats and do it the way it's supposed to be done. And so at that point, uh, we'd had some personnel problems and different things. So a 23 year old, 23 years old with about 10 days on my license, they make me the captain on the HK Thatcher. And I call the office, I said, man, we ain't doing this anymore. This is not good business. Had to fuss around about that. Uh, so then did that work and then Apex had contracted to bunker ships in different anchorages. They tell me, grab this bunker barge, head on down to, to Grandview Anchorage and you'll be bunkering this tanker down there. And I took off down through there. I had never been to New Orleans. I didn't know anything about the vessel traffic scheme or anything else. I got the chart on my lap. I got a flashlight in my hand and I'm steering with both hands, hoping for the best. And took it down there and hooked, and it was New Year's Eve and they were lighting the levees. 
doing the bonfires on the levees down there. Pull in alongside this tanker. We tie it off. They drop a Jacob's ladder over. And then the Coast Guard comes on and said there'll be no bunkering, lightering, or transferring while this while they're lighting the levees. And so I said, okay, guys. You know, Mr. Pilot, it's on with me. Oh no, I was on by myself at that time. I said, stand the radio watch. And when the Coast Guard says we're good to go, get me up and we'll start tankering, lightering. So I wake up at a couple minutes after midnight to the sound of beer bottles landing on the boat and the barges. The guys up on this Greek tanker are able to drink alcohol and they're throwing, throwing the empty bottles over onto us. Oh, this is a whole different kind of towboat in here too. So work for, for Gladys Barge Line went from that 1800 to a 3600 to Thomas W. Martin. We had moved from uh, working around shifting barges in uh, the New Orleans area. And I got very comfortable and posted up doing that. And uh, they contracted with Frontier Barge Lines to push barges on the Upper Miss. So off we went from New Orleans headed for St. Paul. And uh, at that time I was at, uh, the relief captain on that boat. And they'd asked me how many barges I thought we could take. I said, hell, we'll take 12 empties. I stalled in up in a bunch of places, stalled out in places, had to back out of places. That little sucker wouldn't push. Just, it wouldn't push enough to get out of its own way. You said it was a 3,600? No, this was an 1,800. Okay. I eventually went to the 36. Right. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. So this was on the Thatcher that took me to the up, upper miss. And uh, they got a guy on to post me a couple trips on the upper. And off I went on that. Uh, that winter, we shifted around and ran to Illinois. I was familiar with the inner Illinois up to Hardin because that's the area where I lived, but I was learning it on my own after that. And I got pretty comfortable. About 1983, uh, Rick Bensinger called me and asked me if I wanted to move to the Thomas W. Martin, which was a 3,600 horsepower St. Louis ship boat that ran 15 barges. At that time, I was running nine to 12 loads southbound on that 1800 and 15 empties northbound. And so off I went on this 3600 with Steve Crowley, who became the port captain at Ingram and Mark Cat, and uh, a couple other guys that I'd see off and on through the rest of my career. Uh, you know, as a side note, Crowley and I were riding together in 1983, when his first daughter was born, and he walked up the hill to use the phone at the lock at lock number 12. Steve went up to use the phone at lock 12 and found out that his, that his wife's water had broke. She was having a baby. And he came back, and the chief engineer, Dwight Green. So Crowley is, I'm 24, Crowley is 23. The chief engineer is about 35 years old. And he comes up and hears the conversation. He's had a couple of kids. He tells Crowley, you need to go home right now. Crowley says, I don't know, I don't know. we call Ben Singer. And these are the old days when you're calling on a Marine operator. So we would call the Dubuque Marine operator and then have to give our MIN number to make calls and link on through to a regular telephone operator who connected him to his wife. Well, this is all the conversation that's going on, the single sideband radio, which was the other thing we used at the time to make calls to the office and stuff. And during the daylight, the atmospheric conditions made a sideband almost unusable. So we call, we're making all these calls through the marine operator and back and forth. And they say they'll get him off, but they can't get anybody up till the next day. And I tell Crowley, get a cab, go up to Dubuque, go home. And I ran the boat up on up to Dubuque and pushed into the bank and went to sleep until they got, got a relief up there. So, you know, this is old school stuff. And it was pretty loose. We don't do things like that anymore. And we don't do things like that anymore for very good reason. But uh, that's the way we did things at the time. So I got posted on the upper uh, in 84. 
uh, Gladders had bought two boats that had been under contract with other companies, but because the economy had taken a downturn, Jimmy Carter had declared an embargo on the exports of wheat to Russia and export coal markets were undermined by South African coal and they fell. The entire towboat industry just came almost to a standstill. They had overbuilt and the markets turned against them and there were boats tied up all over everywhere. And Gladder's Barge Line had picked up two boats from Jeff Boat, well, one from Jeff Boat, one from Dravot, that were canceled contract boats. Other people saw that the markets were turning down. And, uh, Gladders went ahead and picked up the contract. Time, the economy turns against them and they went bankrupt. So at 24 years old, 20, yeah, 24 years old, with like three years on my license, I'm out of work with a whole lot of other pilots. I went to work for uh, Spartan Transportation. Spartan Transportation was a company who was taking all these repossessed towboats and operating for banks just to make the payments on the boats. So I went from a 3600 to the Arion, which was a 6,000 horsepower jet boat running Alco engines on the upper. It's like, holy cow, I moved into the big time now and uh, fought and struggled and scared, scared myself to death and got through that. And uh, things kind of slowed down a little bit. I went to work for uh, Scott Showtan Incorporated, another one of those companies that's not around anymore, running petroleum barges as a trip captain for them. Then got a job with an Ingram lease operator because of the way the industry was working in the economy. Ingram and Ohio River Company, a couple other companies were leasing their boats out to people, hoping to be able to run cheaper and keep their business going. So I worked for a lease operator named John Ship, who was a Ingram Barge Company guy who had taken them up on their offer of being a lease operator. The way that John Ship's lease contract ran was that we will pay you a certain amount of money to run the Bill Gee, a 28 horsepower Nashville bridge up and down pilot house boat. And anything that's left over is yours. So we had a lot of mashed potatoes made with water instead of milk. That was the kind of operation it was. I heard uh, mashed potatoes with water, not milk, and it, it kind of shut off. Right. So, you know, the one day I came down to eat, we didn't have a cook. I was the captain on the boat, relieving the lease operator guy. And I came down to eat, uh, eat to one of the deckhands had made biscuits and gravy. And it was the crappiest gravy I'd ever eaten. I said, man, who taught you to make gravy? And the mate was from Southern Missouri. He looks at me and he said, that's sawmill gravy. I said, sawmill gravy? He said, yeah, you make it with water instead of milk. And then like the mashed potatoes. Instead of using milk to whip up potatoes, they'd throw water in there because we were running really cheap. And, uh, you know, I had some real adventures doing that. And they were adventures which increased my confidence as a pilot. Here's one for all the old timers. I had never run down the lower, well, it'd been, yeah, I'd run from Memphis to New Orleans. The Arkansas, uh, the White River, Arkansas River mouth up above uh, Victoria from there down in New Orleans. So I jump on his boat and we head to, we're headed for New Orleans. And uh, we've got six grain barges and a loaded three piece unit on a 2,800 horsepower boat. And we get down to uh, Bluegrass Towhead right there at, at uh, Flyville, above Flyville. And they are mat laying. So it's all closed down during the day. And they're letting us through at night. And off we go. And uh, I'm in line. Everybody's in line. And we're floating down the river trying to keep an interval spaced out. And somebody nearly hit the point. Hit the, there's a, a gotcha point at Nebraska point. 
And as he came steering out at Bluegrass Towhead, he nearly hit the point. So now all of the boats in front of me are flanking past Nebraska Point. And that's got me hanging up above. And I get drafted out into the point way. And it's dark and I'm shining the light around trying to make sense of all these buoys. And the contact boat, uh, the Milton Roth was the contact boat and Charles Duncan was on there kind of coordinating traffic. And he called me, he said, Bill Gee, you know you're out in the, in the point way. And I said, well, I'm trying to figure it out, but I'm, I know I'm not where I should be. You think I can back this up out of here? Because it's drafting me down in there. It was, dra it was a strong draft down in the point way. And he said, no, you're not gonna back out of there. <clears throat> you're gonna have to go down the point way and try and come out the lower end. And he gave me a very good briefing on the drafts in the point way as I went down. So I dropped down through there, I run past the draft, poke it down through past the draft, back up again, and I'm trying to get it to flank out the lower end of the point way, and it's not flanking, and the revetment has disappeared under the head of the toe. So I throw the flanking rudders over, get the head going, and come ahead on it, and it makes it. And I said, hoo -wee! That was something. Give me another cup of coffee. Let's get on down the river. And so, you know, I, I found out that I was a good boat handler and I had plenty of nerve and I had the skill to do things to be a towboat pilot. And so, you know, the first five years of my license, you'll hear this story from everybody. I scared myself a lot in that first five years, but learned a lot and became a good pilot because of it. And so we went from there to dropped those grain barges someplace and ran across the canal to Texas City. And that's where the lease operator got back on the boat. And we went up and bought a whole bunch of more powdered, powdered gravy mix and powdered mashed potatoes and a whole bunch of cheap soda and came back on there and said, here we go, let's go again. From there, I went to Conti Carriers. And uh, there was a, a point in there when, uh, between Gladder's barge line and the lease operators and Scott Shotan, where I was driving dump trucks and doing different things to keep body and soul together, because I, you know, uh, I'd been calling around and Dan Brock at Conti Carrier said, Sam, you're a good pilot, but you've got four years on your license and I can pay the same money to guys with 25 years on their license. But there's a glut of pilots right now. So I had a friend who was a dump truck contractor, drove for him, and when things picked back up, went back to work on the river. And I got to working for Conti Carriers. And the first, with the first trip I caught with Conti Carriers was to get on the Conti Carla at Lock 26 with an infamous, infamous towboat pilot, uh, Yank Bouchard, Oscar Henri Bouchard, who had grown up in a French Canadian dairy farming family and had left home, rebelled and left home and was sleeping on a bench in New Orleans near Bissot, Bissot Fleet, near their salvage fleet. And one of the Bissots came down and said, hey, you want a job? And that's how he got his start. And so went from there, ran to Connie Carla, to Connie Nan, to Connie Afton, Connie Mary, Connie Mary Ann, Connie Betty Lynn, Susan, ran all of those boats until Conti Carrier began cutting expenses in order to sell the company to ACBL. And I made the jump to Ingram Barge Company and started tripping for them, tripped in 89 and then into 1990 and took a regular job. BJ Reeves was the port captain, Dan Brock was the Marine superintendent. And the first Ingram boat I got on was the Bill Berry with Captain Ike Sullivan. And Captain Ike Sullivan is a justifiable legend in the towing industry. And that's where I really became a pilot. I was a good throttle and rudder guy. And I was understood boat handling. But when I worked with Ike Sullivan, I learned about how current runs and how geographic features influenced the way drafts and sets work and how to set them up. 
a quick story was we came out of, Ike and I came out of St. Paul with 15 barges on the first trip. And I was very posted there. And I was working at flanking around Red Wing Upper. And because it was low, it wasn't dead pool, but it was not much current. So I was fiddling with the engines, trying to, trying to make it flank faster. I'm a young guy without a whole lot of, a lot of, a lot of patience. And the door opens and Ike comes up to the pilot house and he pours himself a cup of coffee and he sits down on the bench and he says, have you done a lot of flanking? And I said, no, really, I haven't. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you something about flanking. When you got it set up and it's looking pretty, leave it alone. Just sit back and admire it. And I have thought that many times over the next 20, 30 years, that when you got it flanking pretty, sit back and admire it and leave it alone. So there's a good lesson for young pilots. Be a little patient and just admire how pretty that sucker's coming around there. Explain the difference between flanking and steering. So a towboat does not turn like a car. A towboat pivots. So the stern goes one way and the bow goes the other way. Depending on the size of the tow, how the tow is configured and loaded, and how good a boat, the handling characteristics, and how good a boat it is, the pivot point will generally be about one third of the total length of the toe ahead of the toning. So just on most boats like St. Louis ship boats, Dravo boats, a uh, Jeff boat is a little different, but those boats will pivot about 100 feet ahead of the brake cup. So about 500 feet, somewhere between four to 500 feet out from the, from the Tonys is the pivot point. So as you come down into a sharp bend with not much room, as the tow, as the boat pivots, you got to remember that the stern is going to go out into the bank. You're going to wind up with the propellers dragging in the rocks. So the way to counter that is to come down into the bend straight away and slowing the toe down until you get down to current speed. And there's a bunch of different ways of judging that. They have flanking buoys, which are, uh, are rubber balls, orange, big rubber, orange balls tied on lines to the outboard side of the toe. And you can tell how fast you are in relation to the current. But you slow the toe down, slow the toe down, slow the toe down to current speed, and you drop carefully down into the bend. Water always any water anywhere always runs faster to the outside of the bend than it will to the inside. So you keep the boat and the stern of the tow in the slow water, put the head of the tow down into the faster water, and the water hits the flank, the side, the flank of the tow, and will begin to push it around. As it pushes it around, then you adjust the speed to make this whole thing push around, leaving the boat room, nobody's going to ground, nothing's being torn up, and you watch carefully and start bringing the tow back up towards current speed. And as you see the tow, it, then it becomes a timing maneuver. You're watching how fast the tow is swinging, and you begin to push out so that when you push out of the bend, you've got your speed up and you're going in the direction you're going. And Captain Ike Sullivan challenged me to come. He's, he came up with one of those little lessons that Ike always gently put on all of his young pilots, that you know you've made a flank right when you come out of the flank with 10 degrees or less of rudder and you're going the direction you want to go. And so that has always been the standard that I set for my Three standards for flanking. Don't wake everybody up downstairs. Don't scare yourself and come out of there with 10 degrees or less, go in the direction you want to go. And so it's a it's something that Ike Sullivan took great pride in his ability to flank. 
that at the time Ike was running heavy toes on the lower miss, it is nothing like it is today. It was ragged, it was shallow. The dikes were set in funny places. You could hang the head of the toe under the dikes at Devil's Backbone and get an eddy and top around. You could hang the head in the dikes at Greenfield Bend. And you had to flank close to the dikes because the ch channel was so narrow and there was no room. So you were flanking real close to the dikes and if you didn't time it right, the eddies turning off the end of the dikes would catch the head of the toe and it would quit flanking and you'd top around. And so Ike had learned to flank in a period when the lower miss was really a ragged river. And these were his, his standards. This was how he did it. And that's what he passed on to me. And so don't wake everybody up down in the boat. Don't scare yourself and come out with 10 degrees or less rudder going in the direction you want to go. That was, that was his criteria. And that, and I've worked every time I flanked, I would sit there and think of Ike standing over my shoulder and say, okay, we're going to do this to his standards. But flanking is a skill that is a lot of fun and it's something to take great pride in. So I think you said you were with Ingram until 2005 and then tripped from 05 to 20. Yes. Are there any interesting stories come to mind from that last stretch before you retired? Uh, you know, a, a lot of good people. A lot. Of, I got a chance to trip for Western Kentucky Navigation, uh, Marquette, Florida Marine Transporters, Magnolia Marine, uh, a whole bunch. I got to see, as a barge line guy, you pretty much run the Ohio, the Illinois, and the Mississippi. And when I started working, say, for Magnolia Marine Transportation, and I'm running up the Tom Bigby Waterway in the Mobile River, I'm out to Corpus. Uh, there was one, at that time, I was living in Utah. And January, we would get 25 below at night and five below during the day for the month of January. And I'm in Corpus Christi, Texas, on the Little D, and it's like 70 degrees and I'm watching the Blue Angels out practicing their aerobatics over Corpus Christi Bay and a dolphin comes up and blows and my wife calls on the cell phone. She said, hey, what are you doing? As I'm sitting out on the head deck in the sunshine watching the Blue Angels and listening to the dolphin. And she says, I don't want to hear about that. It's 15 below zero here. <laughs> and so, you know, I it was just such a wonderful career. I got to see so many things. I got to meet PhDs. I got to work in as an expert witness. I met attorneys, met underwriters, met inspectors and surveyors, met vice presidents, CEOs of companies, deckhands. I worked with men who couldn't read and write and worked with men who were like I say, a PhD. And it was such a cross section, it was such a rich tapestry that I worked with that it was like living in a book. But one of the things for young guys, and I would talk to them when they would come back to the boat, we'd all ask, what do you, what do, you do while you're on the boat? Well, went to the bars and chased women. Okay, what else you do? Well, I slept all day and go out to the bars and chase women. Well, if that's what you're doing with your days off, you're going to come back to the boat and you're going to get you're going to get real fussy and you're not going to enjoy the job. I have guided elk hunters out of Cody, Wyoming during elk season. I built this is the third place that we're in that I built on my days off. Uh, hunted in the mountains, fly fished, pack trips with horse packing work cattle with my neighbors. Uh, my wife and I worked for a grazing association uh, where we took care of 1,200 head of cattle on the, on the National Forest in Idaho. And so not only is the boat part a rich tapestry, but the life you can have if you have some imagination in working on boats. It's really tough. It's really hard to be away from your kids for 30 days. But when you're home, your kids have you 
for 30 days. There's no come home from work too hard to play, too, too tired to play. And so I'm living out here in the desert in a very economically depressed area. And I refer people to towboat companies all the time. This is a job where you can live where you want to live in the country. And it's a good job, will support your families very well. And then on your days off, you can have all kinds of good experiences with your family. So it always kind of hurt me a little bit. I, I, I talk to guys and they'd say, boy, I'd, I'd tell my kids, don't be a towboat. And I'd tell them, I'd tell my kids, be a towboat. It's a good life, but it's up to you what you make of it. Well, Captain Shrop, I think that will do it for me, sir. I kind of thought that was the wrap up. It's going to work in that direction. That's a great finish. So I do thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, great talk. I appreciate all the reminiscing and uh, I hope all the best for you in your retirement. All righty. Well, I sure appreciate it. And to all my buddies that are watching this, man, I know hundreds of people and, I, and hundreds of boats. So hi to everybody. Well, hopefully we can get a few of them on the, on the show one of these days. Well, I'll be doing my thing in the comment section. We'll keep in touch. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. You too. This has been a production of Where You At Studios, LLC.